So rebaptism, uh, there's quite a lot to say here. Um, first of all, it is we we're in the time of Pope Stephen the first, two fifty four to two fifty seven, when this controversy about baptism comes up. But we know about it. We don't have anything that is directly from Pope Stephen, who is one of the martyrs. And he's not only in the Roman martyrology uh, and has a feast day in the Roman calendar, but he's also in the calendar of Simeon the Metaphrast. So he's definitely a saint for the Romans and Byzantine churches. But we don't have it directly from him. All right, but we know that um, we have uh, from one of the letters of St. Cyprian, we know that Agrippinus of Carthage in the early 3rd century decided that those coming over from certain heresies were to be rebaptized, And this would have been done in Carthage since the early part of the 3rd century. That's St. Cyprian, letter 72. All right, and we also know that St. Stephen objected to this with the words, Nihil innovator. Let there be no innovation. Literally, let nothing be innovated. But with the meaning being, keep to the custom of the church. Don't change any stuff. Don't do any new stuff here. Nihil innovator. Two very important words. Those words alone, alone, should settle who was right and who was wrong in this controversy. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so simple. Rome has had to clarify its stance. I mean, we are not, uh, uh, Pope Stephen was accused of having no zeal against the heretics. Uh, we have this from Vermilion of Caesarea. Stephen, who preaches that he holds the chair of Peter by succession, is moved by no zeal against the heretics. That's not how we talk about saints and martyrs, as I understand it. Um... So that charge should be thrown out. But it is true that Rome needs to, Rome has clarified this over the centuries. So it's well known, or it should be, that the mere fact of having a heretic minister does not make a baptism invalid. Uh, we have to clarify, and there's a lot of Roman theology clarifies, there must be no substantial change in the rite of the sacrament, what the theologians call the matter of form, and there must be what the theologian uh called it the intention of doing what the church does. This, this tends to come up a lot when we hear rumors about Masonic prelates. I don't know how far you can relate, but that's been an issue with us of late. Uh, mm. Nevertheless, nevertheless, if we, if we set aside those qualifiers, the, the position of Rome has still always been that the mere fact of a concomitant heresy, in other words, the minister is in heresy, that alone does not make a baptism invalid. Now, we know that St. Stephen objected, uh, excuse me, we know that Cyprian objected to this. I've already told you that he died in Rome's communion. He, Cyprian is included in the canon of the Mass, meaning we still recognize him as a saint. But we do not, we, we, the Church does not accept what he taught about this, and this clear distinction has to be made. So, I'm going to go to the teachings of other fathers and what they have said about St. Cyprian on this matter. So let's go to, um, well, let's go to St. Jerome first. St. Jerome uh, contra Luciferianos, 23, PL 23, 186. Blessed Cyprian, condemning the baptism of heretics sent the Acts of an Africa, African Council on this matter to Stephen, who was then Bishop of the City of Rome, and the 22nd from Blessed Peter. But his attempt was in vain. Eventually, the very same bishops would lay down with him that heretics were to be rebaptized. Returning to the ancient custom, published a new decree. Again, PL 23-186. Notice, returning to the ancient custom. That tells you who's right and who's wrong. Let there be no innovation. Now, St. Augustine, uh, very unhappy 
when people would name St. Cyprian uh, to defend this rebaptizing error. So he says, first, stay in the church to which Cyprian clearly adhered and preached, and then na- dare to name Cyprian as the author of your teaching, Contra Crisconium, Book 131. And even more clearly than that, again, St. Augustine, I do not accept what Blessed Cyprian thought about baptizing heretics and schismatics, meaning rebaptizing, because the church for which Blessed Cyprian shed his blood does not accept this. Contra Crisconium, Book 232. And then he adds, Cyprian remained, quote, in Catholic unity. Whatever correction Cyprian needed was compensated by his great charity and, of course, this purification of his suffering and the great martyrdom. And that's uh, St. Augustine on Baptism, Book 118. Now, that's not all. Okay, perhaps you're familiar with um, the, the Commandatorium of Vincent of Lorenz, which is basically to uphold the principle that the Catholic faith is uh, based on universality, antiquity, and consent. In Latin, quod semper, quod ubique, quod of omnibus, what was held always everywhere by all. So we go to Vincent, St. Vincent of Lorraine. Agrippinus of venerable memory, who was once Bishop of Carthage. First of all mortals, against the divine canon, against the rule of the universal church, against the opinion of all his fellow priests, against the customs and institutions of the elders, thought that rebaptism ought to be practiced. Then Pope Stephen of blessed memory, Bishop of the Apostolic See, together indeed with the rest of his colleagues, but more than the others, resisted, considering it fitting, I think, that he exceed all the rest as much by the devotion of his faith as he did by the authority of his place. What happened in the end? What force was there in the African council or decree? By God's gift, none. Everything as if a dream or story was trampled upon as if useless, abolished, superseded. PL 50, 645, 646. And even that, there's even more than that, because we have to go to the councils here. Right? To leave no doubt about this. So, when we go to the council, Council of Arles, Canon 8, says this. Regarding the Africans who use their own law to rebaptize, it has been enacted that if anybody comes to the church from heresy, let them ask him the creed, and if, and if they see that he has been baptized in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the hand be opposed to him upon him only, either for penance or in chrismation, that he may receive the Holy Spirit, probably chrismation. But if the person questioned does not answer with this trinity, let him be baptized, Mansi 2, 472. And that's the Roman theology that is no rebaptism or is where there has been baptism in the name of the trinity and no substantial change made in the sacrament. Now, this is even in the Council of Nicaea, Canon 8, which has to do with the Cathars, and we know that that is a name for the Novatians. And it makes it very clear that those who are coming in from the Cathars or Novatians are not to be rebaptized. In other words, the baptism of schismatics is valid, and even their clergy can be accepted under certain conditions as clergy. So even ordinations among the schismatics are tacitly recognized as valid in Canon 8 of Nicaea. Now, I want to add here about this, this business about all bishops allegedly having the chair of Peter. Um, I know you're going to quote St. Cyprian about this, but we have to talk about whether this is the tradition of the Church as a whole. And the tradition of the Church as a whole is very clear. We have in the Liberian catalog the chair of Peter at Antioch. Later on, we have the chair of Peter at Rome. Um, St. Vincent of Lorenz talks about how Pope Stephen exceeded the others by the authority of his place, meaning as Bishop of Rome. So 
was not an equal authority, clearly. And the commonatorium is there for universality, antiquity, and consent. Now, we have to go to St. Jerome as well in the, in the 4th century on the controversy about Antioch. Valencius versus Paulinus in letter 15 and 16 to Damasus. He says he decided to consult the chair of Peter. And the next letter he says, if anybody is joined with the chair of Peter, he is mine. And this is clearly referring to Rome and Damasus. And then later, a bit later in that century, a couple of decades later, we have an Arian bishop complaining about the Orthodox fathers, meaning Damasus, Ambrose, and the Orthodox Council of Aquileia, saying, you know, why do they not realize that the chair of Peter is equal and common to all the bishops? Okay, so if this notion of the chair of Peter being common to all the bishops were the objective tradition of the church, we would not hear an Arian bishop in the fourth century named Maximinus making this objection to St. Damasus and Ambrose and the Council of Aquileia, saying, why don't they accept this? Why don't they understand that? And uh, just to give you a source here, that's uh, the Dissertation Against Ambrose, PL Supplement, Volume 1, 722, Column 722. Um, uh, so, once again, that's another case where when I make a claim, it's a very, very short walk to that primary source on which that claim is based. All right, and this one I have not heard from anybody else, any of the po apologists on either side. So that dissertation against Ambrose is extremely important. It's about time people took note of it. I'll repeat, that's PL Supplement 1, column 722. Why does he, Damasus, not realize, and why do you not understand that the see of Peter is equal and common to all the bishops? Why didn't Damasus understand that? Because it wasn't the case. So with that, Craig, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Please. So I'm going to uh, click that, and when it, when it comes to the issue of the um, I'll just refer people back to the first episode if they just want more details on Peter being the origin of the episcopate. Uh, Pope, Pope Gregory II teaches it, so I, I think we're, we have, I think a Roman Catholic has to accept that. But <laughs> that aside, um, the re, re baptism controversy is going to take some time. I appreciate everyone's patience. It is unfair to say that Cyprian was anti Roman. As he followed the judgment of the Roman Synod and appeals made to Rome, like we've seen letter 14.3, and appealed to the Roman Synod, there's no Pope at the time concerning disagreements, like we've seen letter 22. Elsewhere, he writes to Rome asking for an appeal not to be ruled against him, like we've seen letter 54. So he was not anti-Roman. Only after Rome schism did he appeal from Rome to Vermilion, like we see in uh, letter 74.3. Appeals against Rome were therefore possible. Now, Cyprian's appeal to Cornelius gives us a good window to how he understood the papacy. All right. So that being said, letter 5414 says as follows. Cyprian writes, A false schismatic bishop set sail to bear letters from a schismatic and profane persons to the throne of Peter and to the chief church whence priestly unity takes its source. And not to consider that these were the Romans whose faith was praised in the preaching of the apostle, to whom faithlessness could have no access, for appeals, that is. So Rome's great faith is seen as an honorifically uh, insulating influence against foolish, faithless appeals. Rome is, to quote Cyprian, a source of unity and was the chief church. And by the way, he refers to that the same things in anti-papal letters, we see this in letters 693, 7. So this is intrinsic to Cyprian's thought. Uh, this is a real treat for the listeners. I think this is the first time in YouTube's history where both guys talk about Cyprian actually read everything he ever wrote. So <laughs> that being said, this is intrinsic to Cyprian's thought. Now, in short, Rome is a root for unity, but to an extent. 
Consider how the same letter ends. So we just read letter 5414, where he says uh, about the appeal to the throne of Peter, um, how they're the source of unity. How does he end the letter? In paragraph 20, I know, dearest brother, uh, he, he writes to Cornelius, by the way, um, from the mutual love which we owe and manifest one towards another, that you always read my letters to the very distinguished clergy who preside with you there. Yet now I both warn and ask you to do by my request what at other times you do of your own accord and courtesy. So we can see why John says that Cornelius and Cyprian are really close. Cyprian's literally dictating to the Pope. He's warning him even. The Pope can, cannot act unilaterally. He owes, in the name of Cip, in the words of Cyprian, love and a sort of obedience to Cyprian. That, that, that even scandalizes me. Cyprian actually threatens the Pope here. He warns him, which shows understood limit to the honorific stated previously. It's one thing to say these other things, but when he tells the Pope what to do, we can kind of see, well, what's he really mean by this? It's hard to understand in a few words, but the early church prized consent and doing disagreeable things would sooner bring about silence or abstaining from taking a view than overt opposition. All right. So one has to read the councils to understand. And Father Richard Price speaks of conciliar procedure working this way. But that kind of explains why, like, Cyprian dictates something at Cornelius. Like, he doesn't write anything back. It's just, you, you don't just disagree with someone. That creates a huge controversy. You don't see this in the early church. Not unless there's an issue. Now, Unsurprisingly, Cyprian had a very explicit ecclesiology of conciliar consent. Explicit. We see this in letters 13 2, 17, 18, 22 4, 32 1, 52, 64 1, 661. He, he even like apologizes for ordaining a reader without the permission of the other bishops. I mean, we would never see that today. This is how explicit he was about consent. Here are like, I think, the best examples. In letter 14 3, for example, he says, Our proceedings, writes Cyprian, ought to be united and to agree in all things. He writes in letter 19, communicate to as many of our colleagues as you can that among all these may be observed one mode of action in one agreement. He writes in letter 51.8, to the place of Fabian, that is, when the place of Peter and the degree of the sacerdotal throne was vacant, which being occupied the will, by the will of God and established by the consent of all of us. Whosoever now wishes to become a bishop must needs be made from without, and he cannot have the ordination of the church who does not hold the unity of the church. So as we can see in letter 51.8, the place of Peter is held by the entire Roman Synod, the consent of all of us, and that includes Africa, which is the part of their which is part of their jurisdiction. Now, of course, that was that's true before the Pope is actually ordained, because this is I think 51 is written to Cornelius, if I remember right, but he's speaking the time before he was ordained. Additionally, a true successor of Peter must have the consent of that whole jurisdiction. As we see there, it's the whole novationist controversy is about. Just so people know, Apostolic Canon 34, which requires submission and consent between bishops and their metropolitans, follows the same logic. So this is a consistent thread in early church ecclesiology. Now, the ecclesiology of consent permeated the church and the Roman Synod. This is not just Cyprian's opinion in the third century. What's my evidence? Well, the Roman Synod before St. Cyprian hardly concurred. They actually wrote about it. We can quote the Roman Synod. We see this in letter 31. And uh, it's the Roman Synod writing, but they ascribe it to Cyprian. But this is the Roman Synod. They write, they, the bishops, owe their conscience to God alone as the judge. Yet desire their doing should be approved also by their brethren themselves. It is no wonder, Brother Cyprian, we should be found not so much judges of as sharers in your council. So as we can see, this idea that God alone is judge is something Cyprian concurred with. As around the same as he borrowed this, probably from the Roman Synod and other letters of his. For example, you could read in letter 53:5, he writes to Cornelius. He, the bishop, shall give an account to the Lord in the day of judgment. And elsewhere, he writes in letter 51, 21, every bishop disposes and directs his own acts and will have to give an account of his uh, purposes to the Lord. So we see that 
this idea of consent and that only God alone judges the bishops, they all have their, their own right to make a judgment. This is something that was written to a pope. This is something that the Roman Synod wrote to Cyprian. It's a common idea. Now the Roman Synod writes about consent as elsewhere. Letter 35, 30.5. That cannot be a firm decree which shall not appear to have had the consent of very many. Very interesting, just so people know, Vatican I explicitly delineates that consent is not necessary from the bishops for the Pope to speak infallibly. But the Roman Synod, as we see, wrote otherwise in letter 30.5. In letter 29.4, the Roman Synod writes, it becomes us all to watch for the body of the whole church. Right, so the Roman Synod seems to think of every member of the Synod as someone that has his oversight over the whole church, his spiritual authority over the whole church. So an interesting passage. We also see letter 45.3. At points they consent to Cyprian, dictating to them. So Cyprian writes the Roman Synod, and he says what they ought to do vis-a-vis -vis other synods. And Cyprian actually admonishes Cornelius in 45.3. You ought to send these letters to other churches. And he uh, has a similar statement in letter 44. So I say the proceeding, because this really is the background between the Spatus Cyprian and Pope St. Stephen, right? We kind of see everyone on board with this consent idea. We kind of see Cyprian wearing the man pants and Cornelius with humility, and he's also a martyr and a saint, letting Cyprian, you know, kind of take the, the wheel in some respects, at least verbally, let's say. Well, St. Stephen, who's a miracle worker, by the way, he's a saint of our church. Um, he was not that sort of personality. He was kind of like another Cyprian, which is sometimes that creates issues. Well, how did it start? Cyprian was sent an appeal from Gaul, which was also sent to Rome. Now, Cyprian behooves, in a letter to Stephen, he says he behooves Stephen to affirm Africa's excommunication of their Gaulish opposition and affirms bishop and to affirm the bishops recognized by Africa. We see this in letter 66 too. So he's trying to dictate to Stephen the same way he used to dictate to Cornelius. Now the appeal was likely sent to Cyprian first because Cornelius was martyred and Stephen was only recently elected as Pope. All right, so that we see that in letter 66.3. So I think Stephen perceived this as Cyprian stepping on his toes, okay? Now the African Synod also took an appeal from the Spanish Synod, and we see this in letter 67. Spain excommunicated two bishops, Africa affirmed their judgment, but then those people that are excommunicated appealed to Rome, and lo and behold, Rome did not, under Stephen, affirm those excommunications. Suddenly, an argument over rebaptism erupted, right? I say suddenly because we read from Cornelius that Novation should have never been Pope because he was baptized by effusion and not chrismated. So this sort of like idea that we got to baptize guys the right way that Cyprian was saying, well, it's not like no one Rome never said that before. Now we lack Stephen's letters. So everything we have is quoted from his opponents, which is obviously problematic, but we have some good idea of what he really said. Now, for example, in letter 71, Cyprian writes, for neither did Peter, whom first the Lord chose, and upon whom he built his church, when Paul disputed with him afterwards about circumcision, claim anything to himself instantly, nor arrogantly assume anything, so as to say that he held the primacy, and that he ought rather to be obeyed by novices and those lately come. So I think this also, by the way, crosses letter 75, 8, that Stephen must have demanded to be obeyed. Why else say that? Due to holding primacy. So like these are ideas that uh, the Pope was ascribing to himself. We got to be aware of this. Cyprian rejects this obviously, but not rejecting Petrine authority, but presuming Peter can be both corrected and obedience is not a given. Because what? What's necessary? Consent is necessary. Like we see in a, a Apostolic Canon 34, the letter of the Roman Synod, letter 30 in Cyprian's corpus. Now, for example, the Council of Carthage in 258, I think it's around 110 bishops that sign on to it. Might have been 90, something like that. It says, for neither does any of us set himself as a bishop of bishops. Again, that word again. Nor by tyrannical terror does any compel his colleague to the necessity of obedience. Right? So we can see this is something Stephen was asking for. Since every bishop, according to the allowance of his liberty and power, has his own proper right of judgment and can no more be judged by another than he himself can judge another but let us all await for the judgment of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
ironically using those words of the Roman Synod back at them. Um, we also see this very similar terminology in letter Sunday 226 on the same topic. So the, the, the proceeding was not a duplicitous excuse for disobeying Pope Stephen because it was an invocation of what the Roman Synod itself taught and what Cyprian himself wrote to Cornelius. So it's not the first time anyone said such a thing. So in response, of course, not to the, uh, can, not the Council 258, but to similar things in other letters, Stephen excommunicated Cyprian. And at a later point, St. Fermilian for writing so explicitly against him. Now, and just so people know, Fermilian is a saint in the Orthodox Church. Now, before Stephen, the quote of uh, letter six from Dionysius Alexandria, we could, you can read this, the Anti-Nicene Christian Library, volume 20, departed from their communion. Fermilian wrote, this is letter 7416, they who are at Rome vainly pretend the authority of the apostles, defaming Peter and Paul. So this shows Stephen cited his authority derived from Peter and Paul when excommunicating, right? And the whole synod, by the way, they who are at Rome. It also shows that Dionysius understood that Stephen had the capacity to break himself off from others, right? He departed from their communion, but not to excommunicate outside of his jurisdiction. By the way, other translations concur. You can read Feltlow's St. Dionysius Alexandria Letters and Treatises, page 55. It gives a very similar translation, this idea of departed from their communion, not excommunicated, like we see addressed to Cyprian, who was within the synod of the Roman synod. Now, Vermillion interprets Stephen's actions as schismatic. Vermillion writes in the same section, uh, 74, 16, the peace and unity of the Catholic Church such as Stephen has now dared to make, breaking the peace against you, he writes to Cyprian. He says in 74, 24, Vermillion writes, he, Stephen, is really the schismatic who has made himself an apostate from the communion of ecclesiastical unity. For while you, Stephen, think that all may be excommunicated by you, you have excommunicated yourself alone from all. So the proceeding, impl the proceeding implies that Stephen did assume the authority of excommunicating all, which probably meant those within his own jurisdiction. Because in... Um, Vermillion's letter, he indicates that only Cyprian was excommunicated. Vermillion doesn't say that he was. He actually speaks of an earlier excommunication in Asa by Pope Victor. So Vermillion was probably excommunicated by Stephen, or at least um, walled off from communion is probably a more accurate way to put it, after this very insulting letter came out. Now, Stephen boasts, according to 7417 from Vermillion, of the place of his episcopate, and contends that he holds succession from Peter on which whom the foundations of the church were laid. The Christian rock is overshadowed and in some measure abolished by him when he thus betrays and deserts unity. So according to St. Vermilion, schism and rejecting unity consent abolishes any claim to patron authority. This is very interesting. This is consistent with the view that Peter alone is the origin of the episcopate and that the apostles alone and and the bishops who succeeded them by vicarious ordination constitute the disciplinary, disciplinary authority of the church as Vermillion discusses. By the way, Peter alone, apostles alone, the bishops who succeeded them. Those are all direct quotes from letter 7416. Now, Cyprian claims Stephen is a schismatic based upon the same logic. He writes in letter 72-2, we who hold those who are against this rebaptism, uh, the without rebaptizing rather, we who hold the head and root of the one church know and trust for certain that nothing's lawful there outside the church. So in other words, those who stay in communion with the rest of the church, the head and the root, are not schismatics, but those who break unity like the Novationists are. Interesting, you see, that's what Stephen did. Now, this is consistent. This is not some new idea Cyprian came up with because he's got to fight. It's consistent with his ecclesiological claims for Stephen's schism from Carthage, which were accepted by Rome during the Novationist controversy. In Treatise 1.4, for example, it says that he might set forth unity, he that is God ar arranged by his authority, the origin of that unity as beginning from one. Assuredly, the rest of the apostles were also the same as was Peter, endowed with a like partnership both of honor and power, but the beginning proceeds from unity. We see in also treatise 112. For we have not withdrawn from them, the Novationists, but they from us. They have forsaken the head and the source of the truth. Right? So he's saying those who break from someone else are the ones who forsake the head and the source. 
So the head is not the person, the Pope, it's the people in communion in the Catholic Church. Um, and so that's why he says Stephen went to schism. Letter 72, for example, he speaks of the head as not being the Pope, but it's the unity of Petri bishops. Now Cornelius concerning the Novations also uses the term very similarly. So this is not Cyprian using the term in his own way. We see letter 41.1. The adverse party has not only rejected the bustle and the embrace of its root and mother, the adverse party is Novations, but even with the discord, spreading and reviving itself worse and worse has appointed a bishop for itself. So as we see, the root is not the Pope, as letter 72.2 shows, but it's the unity of the Petrine bishops. Also check out Tradius 11.11. Now, the whole idea of bishop of bishops, as we talked about, um, is Flora, um, Flora is, was something ascribed to Florentinus in letter 68.8. A novation writes to Florentinus, a novation. The bishop is in the church, and the church in the bishop, and if anyone not be with the bishop, that he is not with the church. The church, which is Catholic in one, is not cut nor divided, but is indeed connected and bound together by the cement of priests who cohere with one another. Right? So in other words, breaking from a legitimate bishop, as the Novations did, is definitionally schismatic. Right? He's not writing this to Stephen at that point. He's writing this to a Novation. This applies not only just to Rome, but to any bishop who rejects the consent of the church as the Novationists did, being that the church accepted his ordination. Now, um, there's a lot of confusion, in my opinion, due to the Eusebius of Caesarea favoring the Roman custom, and quite frankly, Vincent de Lorenz, Augustine, La, um, they're saints that do. And this preceding bias has fundamentally altered how people interpret Dionysius of Alexandria on this question, whom Eusebius quotes. Now, and by the way, in our, when I talked to Novationists, that was book six, not book five. Here we're talking book seven, uh, five, uh, chapter five, verses four to five in Eusebius Church History. This has Dionysius' letter to Pope Sixtus II. He writes, He, Pope Stephen, therefore had written, proceeding concerning Hellenus and Firmilianus, that's Firmilian, and all those in Cilia and Cappadocia and Galatia, and the neighboring nations, saying that he would not commune with them for this same cause, that they rebaptize heretics, but consider the importance of the matter. For truly, in the largest synods of the bishops, decrees have been passed on this subject, that those coming over from heresies should be washed and cleansed from the filth of the old and pure leaven, and I wrote entreating Stephen concerning all these things. And again, now it's a, a council in Carthage under Agrippus, uh, and uh, a council in Iconium um, in the early third century also, um, which is where Familian came from. So being that he's appealing to the antiquity of these councils, saying that um, Stephen should have understood, he entreated him about these things, does it sound like that Dionysius agreed to Stephen? Obviously it does not. Dionysius clearly supported Cyprian. He even quoted Cyprian. So much historians have missed out on this because only in the last 150 years have we actually recovered letters that were in Arminian from St. Dionysius, which show how clear this is. So for example, letter to Stephen, this is the Arminian letter one, uh, translated by Koine Bear. Um, it's also found by the white in a Syriac fragment and a Greek katina on Deuteronomy. And you can read that in Feltlow's St. Dionysius Alexandria pages 53 to 54. So this is how we know it's not a forgery. It says, to Stephen, for these reasons that we may be in accord, again, that idea of consent, church with church and bishop with bishop and elder with elder, let us be careful in our utterances. This is what he's writing to Pope Stephen. Moreover, in judging and of dealing, judging of and dealing with particular cases of baptism, we give instructions to the local primates who under divine imposition of hands are appointed to discharge these duties. For they shall give a summary account to the Lord of whatsoever they do. Well, where have we read and heard that before? Cyprian letter 71.3 and lots of other letters. For example, St. Cyprian writes, We neither do violence to nor impose a law upon anyone, since each prelate has in the administration of the church the exercise of his free will, as he shall give an account of his conduct to the Lord. So literally the same thing. He says he gave instructions to prelates. Um, that's what Dionysius writes. Um, to the to the primates, and that they all shall give account to God. That's exactly what Cyprian wrote in 71.3. Yet they supposedly disagree with each other. 
It's like people aren't reading the primary sources. Um, in Armenian letter two, also in Corny Bear, to Pope Sixtus II, Saint Dionysius writes, "Those over whom there has been there has not been invoked the name of the Father and of the Son or of the Son or of the Holy Spirit, these we must baptize, but not rebaptize." This is sure and immovable teaching tradition. Now, what Saint Cyprian say, letter seventy two, we say that those who come thence from the schismatics are not rebaptized among us, but are baptized. Right, so Cyprian's not saying we're rebaptizers. He's saying they were never baptized, and that's the same thing that Saint Dionysius said. Though, in my opinion, he's a, a little more modern in his approach. Now, in closing, this has gone long enough. Saint Stephen was the Pope was perceived as wrong on the rebaptism controversy during his day, based on the sources actually contemporary to those events, Vermilion and Dionysius and Cyprian. But this is not the main point for our purposes, even though Cyprian and Dionysius and Vermilion all represented the biggest synods of their days other than Antioch. Rather, the whole Christian world refused to submit to Pope St. Stephen's view or recognize his excommunication, but rather viewed him as the schismatic in disturbing the peace of the churches. The ecclesiology of conciliarity and consent won out over Stephen's intransigence on this matter. Otherwise, on other matters, he's a miracle worker, a martyr, he's a saint. Stephen may have not been actually asserting papal supremacy, and this is where I want to kind of justify him. He surely excommunicated Cyprian, but our only extant source states that he merely refused to commune with Vermilion. All right, so there's no implication he understood his actions as literally removing Vermilion from the church, as this would have been far more scandalous than what he was actually criticized for.